Let us pray with the Christ who is within us and among us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. It's always a joy to be at our cathedral. I'm sorry I couldn't be here last week for what I heard was a great celebration of Tom Callard's ministry among us. I had two churches in Worcester last Sunday, and I couldn't break that schedule. Um, I was also supposed to be someplace else today, but I got that changed because I really wanted to be with you as you start this transition. And to know that you have my support and the support of my staff and the support of our whole diocese as you go through this time of, of having said goodbye to Tom, saying hello to your new interim, and to see what the future holds, which is going to be a very, very blessed future. You know, you've got Bernie Poppy as your new interim, and he'll be here December 1st. I know Bernie very, very well. He served for four years in a, another church that was an urban church like you are, uh, and a big, big building with all saints in Worcester. And he did a phenomenal job there. So I really look forward to him joining our community December 1st. And as so many things will continue, just as they've been a blessing throughout all, all the many years here at the, at the cathedral. With Linda's leadership, uh, can, all the great outreach programs that you have, they will continue. And as you can hear from how great the choir was this morning, the choir will continue and continue to grow and bless us. So you have my prayers, my support, and this is a tremendously blessed time. Even as we say goodbye to Tom, we say hello to something new. So let's look for a moment at today's gospel. And all the words in today's gospel are important. And that's because this story really is not a story about taxes. It really is. It's a story about things that are much more important and much more personal than just taxes. So let's look at that. The story starts out with the Pharisees and Herodians coming to see Jesus. And that's really significant. Because the Pharisees and Herodians did not like each other. So the Pharisees were there representing the temple. And they greatly resented the empire. The Roman Empire that had taken over their country. The Herodians were also Jewish people. But as you can imply by the name, the Herodians, they, they liked the king. They were okay with the empire. And so they come together, they conspire to trap Jesus. And then they ask him the question, not the question of, is it lawful or good to pay taxes? That's not the question. The question is, is it okay to pay taxes to the emperor? Of which the Herodians were hoping he would say yes, the Pharisees were hoping he would say no, and that would lead to all kinds of chaos for Jesus. But then the next thing that happens is also very important. Jesus says, takes out a coin, and says, whose head is on this and whose title? Whose head is on it and whose title? Actually, people who know their New Testament Greek, because remember the New Testament was written in Greek, people who know that Greek better than I do, say that that's not really a great translation. It should have said, in whose likeness is this coin? And if you know that, in whose likeness, then your mind automatically goes back to the opening chapter of Genesis, in which we hear God say, let us, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. Likeness is an iconic word. It means this. It means that you are made in the likeness of God. And it's not your, not your likeness on this coin. But what he's saying is that we bear God's likeness and we're made to be more than we sometimes realize. So just pause for a moment and let that sink in. You and I, every single one of us, was made in the image and the likeness of God. And because we bear God's likeness, we are to act like God. Not, mind you, like gods, those who lord their authority over others for self-gain, but rather like the God of Jesus, 
the one who creates and sustains and nurtures and redeems, no matter what the cost. We are called then to serve as God's agents, God's partners, and God's co-workers. Exercising dominion over creation, not as an act of power, but as an act of stewardship, and extending to all the abundant life that God wishes for all of us. So I'm going to tell a story now that I've told at this church once before, a long time ago. Some of you might remember it. It's the story of my daughter, Grace, who's now an adult. But when she was three years old, my daughter, Grace, when she was in church, and she heard the word grace in a prayer or in a sermon, she would literally shout out, hey, that's my name. <laughs> You'd be amazed how many times the word grace is used in your Episcopal liturgy. So she would do that. And, but then one day, we were going to a different church. And we told them, this is not going to be like St. Peter's. This is a much different church. And what it was, was a convent for Episcopal sisters. And we were going there because of one of my good friends, an Episcopal priest, was being made their chaplain. So we were going to that service. So we said, now this is not going to be like St. Peter's. You've got to be really quiet in this church. Well, we get there, and we were actually sitting up in the choir loft, and we see the sisters processing, all in habits. Think sound of music. And they're walking in, it's really quiet. And we get a sense this, again, is not like St. Peter's. Well, the service begins, and it goes on for a little while, and then the word grace gets used in a prayer. I'm thinking, okay, here he comes. But instead, all I felt was a tug on my sleeve. And I looked down, and there's Grace going like this. <laughs> there's a great truth in that. She embodies Grace. And that's true for you and me. Grace isn't just a concept out there, it's not an idea. We embody grace because we're made in the likeness of God. That is who we are. You know, the story in the story, too, the story about the emperor, the story in which we're told that we are made in the likeness of God. Notice the fact that when Jesus accuses, accuses his listeners, the, Her the Herodians and the Pharisees, he accuses them of hypocrisy. You notice that in the story? Because they're not being true to who they are. They're not being true to who they are. He calls them hypocrites because quite literally taken to wearing another in false likeness. They no longer recognize they're made in the likeness of God. So the next part of the story happens. And we hear that the Herodians and the Pharisees were amazed. And then they went away. How surprising is that? Are you amazed at Jesus? Are you amazed at what Jesus has done in your life? Are you amazed at what Jesus has done in this world? As Michael Curry says, we are the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. It's not to change the world from the nightmare it is for so many into the dream that God has for us. Isn't that amazing? So they're amazed, and they went away. You're amazed, and you came here. You're amazed, and you'll look at ways to draw closer to the Jesus who loves you. And as we look at that, we say, now that we're drawn in, we're amazed, we're drawn to Jesus, then we're called, called to reflect. So I invite you to consider these questions, because you haven't gone away. Where are you now in the overall arc of your life, or in the particular part of your life? Where are you now? And it's going to be different for everyone, and it's different at different points in our life. 
Where are you now? Another question. What is your life asking of you now? Again, that might be different than the way you answered it 20 years ago or 40 years ago. What is your life? Your life, which is the likeness of God, what is your life asking of you now? And then, speaking spiritually, what do you need in order to live into the person God is calling you to become? What is it that you need? And then, what rhythms or practices do you need in your life to better seek God's presence and wisdom? To open the experience of the mercy and love of God and to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit. What are the practices that you and I need to put into place for us to always be reminded that we're in the likeness of God? And then, let's take those questions and apply them to the cathedral at this time of transition. Where is the cathedral now in the overall arc of its life as a community of faith? What of the past do we have here? that we honor in what lies before us as a community of faith. And then, just like we talked about spiritual practice in our own lives, spiritually speaking, what does this community need to live into God's dream for us? What rhythms and practices does this community need to seek God's presence and wisdom experience more deeply the mercy and love of God and to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Those are valid questions. Questions which we need our creativity and our imagination and our guidance by the living God to be able to answer. And as we do that, I invite you to always remember two phrases that Jesus used over and over again. One phrase was, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. And the other, which he actually uses more often than he uses the word love one another, which he used a lot, the phrase that he uses even more is stay awake. Stay awake. Stay awake to the ways that God is acting in our lives, but stay awake to the ways that God is acting in this cathedral. Amen. Amen.